OK, we're at Berkeley time, so let's get started. How's everyone doing today? Good? Good, that's good to hear. So today, what are we going to cover? The presenter remote does not work again. That's the first thing. So we're going to first talk about how to know if you will be approved for a card or not. Right? You, don't not, you do not want to get denied for a card that you applied for because you receive a hard inquiry either way. So every hard inquiry you receive ideally should be an approval. This is going to load. OK. Huh. There we go, somehow. So to make sure that you're going to be approved for a card, we're going to talk about using the reconsideration line. So not every denial for a credit card is an actual denial. You can actually call into the bank and ask to be reconsidered for the card, and it can work. And then we're going to talk about the basics of card issuer rules. These are extremely important because if you're in violation of these rules, you cannot get a card from that issuer, regardless of your credit score, regardless of other factors in your credit history. And then we're also going to talk about an intro to points programs and actually how to extract value from this game. And then we're, oh, on that, we're going to talk about flexible versus non-flexible points currencies. So not all points are created equal, and there's advantages and disadvantages to each. And then we're going to talk about how to acquire some points. So how to tell if I will be approved? So banks have very complicated and secret algorithms to determine whether or not people are going to be approved for cards or not. And these are kind of their secret sauce. This is what makes them unique from other banks, and they want to keep these top secret. However, we can look at data points online to see who is approved or denied for certain cards. And we can use that to figure out if people will be approved or not. OK. This is really not working today. Huh. OK, yeah, we're going to go roll with it. OK, so the key is to understand the rules, which we can find out from the data points online. And we're going to cover the basics of these today. So you may receive certain matched offers online from credit reporting agencies or, or actually, yeah, mainly credit reporting agencies. So Experian, Credit Karma, et cetera. These are meaningless. When you see these, these are marketing offers. So if it says your Credit Karma chance of approval is excellent or Experian matched for you, stuff like that, entirely meaningless. You should ignore it. It's a marketing offer. They're trying to get you to apply for the card. When I first got started into this game and I didn't really know what I was doing and I didn't have a good understanding of the card issuer rules, I had a matched offer for the Chase Sapphire Preferred with only like seven months of credit history. We haven't talked about the rules for Chase yet, but there was no way I was getting that card. It said it was matched for me. I thought I had a good chance. I applied for it. Chase told me to kick rocks. So it wasn't going to happen. And I should have not followed those rules or those uh, offers. Now, what can be useful, however, is offers directly from the bank or targeted offers from credit monitoring websites. Not agencies like Experian, but websites. So Credit Karma does have some targeted offers. Creditcards.com has some targeted offers. If it's one of those, or if it's directly from the bank, it can be useful. And so what these might look like, you might see a, these are the famous Chase Black Star offers. So these can actually mean something. This will be directly on your Chase account. Or this is taken from creditcards.com, the pre-qualified offer for the Platinum card. There's a special offer as a sign-up bonus on the American Express Platinum card that can really only be found by being targeted and one of the main ways to be targeted is through creditcards.com. So these actually can mean something. So what if you get denied? If you're denied, the important thing to remember is that not every denial is actually a real denial. Sometimes banks need to verify your information to protect themselves against fraud. You might have been initially denied, but you can call them up, verify some information for them, such as proof of address, maybe faxing in a social security card copy, et cetera, 
and they can actually approve you. Now, if you're actually denied denied, you can call the reconsideration line or department. Pretty much every major bank has one of these. And the idea is you call them up, you say, hey, I was denied for this card. I'd like to get this card. I am a responsible credit user. I'm a good customer. I'd like to build a relationship with this bank, stuff like that. And they'll look over your profile and they might either go, okay, you know what? We can actually make this an approval and they'll give you the card or they'll say to kick rocks. And well, if they tell you to kick rocks, then hook a, hang up, call again. If they tell you to kick rocks for about five more calls, then you're not getting the card. But it can be useful if you were denied to call them up and try to get it. So some good reasons, right? I want to build a relationship with this bank. I'm a good customer. I pay off my cards in full, stuff like that. Don't mention the bonus. They really don't want people getting cards just for the sign-up bonus. So don't just say, hey, I want to get this card because I want to churn the bonus and cancel it in a year. They're not going to like that. So don't say anything like that. Any questions so far? Yes. Oh, it's a great question. If you're calling the reconsideration line, it should not be a new hard inquiry oh. because it's the same application. They have to ask your permission to do a hard inquiry. So if they say, we need to run your credit again, then that's a hard inquiry, don't do it. But they should be able to look over the application you submitted and it should not be a hard inquiry. Great question. Any other questions? Cool, so let's move on. Okay, so what now? We've told you how to get approved for a card. So what do you want to do after getting your first credit card? This is going to be heavily dependent on what your strategy is, what you want to do, and how aggressive you're willing to play the game. It's typically a good idea to wait at least four to six months before getting another card after your first credit card. At the most, you should have three personal cards, in my opinion, before the one year mark. An optimal strategy would probably be two. And there's a rule regarding this that we're gonna talk about in a minute. So between two to three at the one year mark. You could even do one if you want, but two isn't bad either. And there's not really a need to rush after getting your first card. The most important thing is getting your foot in the door at least having one credit card that's building history. That is like your anchor, that's the most important thing. How old is your oldest credit card? That is the main thing that shows the banks how responsible you are with your credit. So if you don't have any credit history yet, you should get a credit card ASAP. That's the most important thing. You don't need to rush into getting a second or third card yet, so you should start considering it, but the important thing is at least getting one. Any questions? Okay, so what do you do now? Once you've built up some good credit history, you've got a card or two, what do we do? So how am I defining good history first? I'm defining this as one, you have to have at least one year of personal credit history. So not including authorized user accounts. This isn't your average age of accounts, just your oldest account. Your oldest personal credit card account needs to be one year of age for me to consider it good credit history. You need no missed payments. I think that one's self-explanatory. If you missed payments in the past, that's tricky. But for this case, let's assume we're all being very responsible and we have no missed payments or anything like that. And a low current utilization. Remember, utilization has zero memory. So if it's high right now, no big deal. You can just get it down next month. Just don't apply for cards when you have really high utilization because it looks risky to the banks. It looks like you owe a lot of debt. So this is where things get interesting now. Once you've surpassed the one year history, once you have a card or two, once you've built up some good credit history, this is where stuff starts to get fun. So I can't tell you exactly which card or cards to get once you have good history. Again, it's dependent on your strategy. What I can do, however, this would load, I can cover the major issuer rules, their points programs, the benefits of their cards, etc. And you can use that information to make an informed decision on your own. So with that said, let's now talk about some of the major players in the credit card game, some of the big banks. 
if the next slide would load. Okay, so at the God tier, the absolute best card issuers there are, we have Chase and American Express. No one can touch these two. These are at the top. Again, this is just my opinion, but I think most people in the credit card game would agree that Chase and Amex, number one, undisputed. Between the two, debatable. Whoops. Where is my... That is some code I had for a project before. <laughs> so, A tier, we have City and Capital One. They're both good, nowhere near as good as Chase and Amex. Capital One has recently made some money moves and is going up in terms of their quality, and City is going down. City really hasn't been that competitive in the past few years. Capital One is making some hard money moves and trying to become a really good issuer now. Whoops. In terms of B tier, we have Discover and US Bank. Still decent issuers, nothing that special though. Discover, really the only card you're ever gonna wanna get from them is the Discover It. US Bank actually has some decent cards, but they're so, so, so strict on who they approve. Oftentimes it's kind of irrelevant for a lot of people in this game, just because to realistically get one of their cards, you have to slow down so much, it's really not worth it. Decent cards though. At a kind of an interesting tier of the 90% trash, but 10% semi-god tier, where some of the cards are like suspiciously good, but all the other ones are pretty uninteresting. We have Barclays Bank and Bank of America. There's one card from Barclays and one card or two cards from Bank of America that are actually really good. Other than that though, in my opinion, nothing interesting. In trash tier, we have Wells Fargo. <laughs> and in its own tier, whoops, we have Credit One <laughs> at the very bottom. Does anyone want to disagree with this tier list? Anyone have any differing opinions? Yes. So the question, uh, for those watching online, the question was, what's up with Credit One? So Credit One is essentially a fee harvester bank. So what they'll do is they'll send targeted offers to people with really, really bad credit history, trying to get them to sign up for cards that have high annual fees, but no benefits. So they'll charge you like 90 bucks a year for a card that gets you 1% cash back on select categories. A 1% cash back card on everything is bad already, even without an annual fee. So the fact they're charging you an annual fee and they're only giving you cash back in select areas, it's just all around bad. If, you have, if someone really has bad credit history, they should get a secured card, not one of these. It will actually still save them money, even if they didn't have money for the deposit. By the time you get through with all the fees of Credit One, you're gonna be out a lot more money. Yes? Okay, great question. So, gold, yeah, I didn't put them on this tier list pretty much because the only major card they issue is the Apple card. So the interesting thing about the Apple card is you can be approved before they run your credit. So what happens is they'll tell you if you're approved or not. And then if you accept the offer, then they run the hard inquiry on your credit because it's effectively showing that you applied for the card. If you're denied, they'll just tell you. Or you can also choose to decline the offer. So that's one pretty cool thing. I think it's a decent card. I don't think there's anything like special about it. I would say though, it's absolutely not a bad card. It's just a pretty standard cashback card. Any other questions? Sorry, what was the question? Why is US Bank not in the A tier? Personally, I don't have them in A tier mainly because how difficult it is to be approved. Just because the rule of, I believe, one inquiry every 12 months, or was it one account every 12 months? It's the specifics are blanking me, but it's very difficult to get approved for a US bank card. And even then, they do have a, some good cards, but it's nothing truly special. And since they have zero transfer partners as well, it's hard to get really good value from their points in my opinion. So I would still put them below City and Capital One, even if it was easier to get approved. But yeah, that combined with the fact it is just so difficult to get one of their cards is why I, I have them in B tier. Okay, so moving on. Uh, we're going to talk about now the card issuer rules. So the basics of application rules for various card issuers. And in fact, we're only going to talk about the two main ones. So first, we're going to talk about Chase. 
Chase, their main rules, the one that you're going to want to know about first is the one year rule. This is not something like written down in Chase's guidelines at all, but this is what's been seen online from application data points. You're going to need one year of individual history before you're going to get approved for a Chase card. So not authorized user history, individual history. Your oldest account needs to be at least one year old. Now, if you have a good relationship with Chase, you can sometimes waive this requirement. So by good relationship, we just mean having a lot of money with the bank. If you have a Chase account with a lot of money in it, you can probably bypass this one-year rule. A lot of data points online have shown that to be successful, where people are getting approved for Chase cards with very little history because they have $10,000, $20,000 with the bank. So they really like you when you keep your money with them. So remember that. If you want to get a Chase card, put some money in their account, and they'll, might, they'll maybe help you out. So the next rule is the 230 rule. This is not 100% a full hard rule. They sometimes don't enforce it. Let's just treat it as they always enforce it because it's really risky to go beyond this. So you can only be approved for two Chase cards within 30 days of each other. If I apply for a Chase card today and I apply for another one today and I get approved for both, I need to wait 30 days before getting any more. Otherwise, I will be automatically denied. And most importantly, this is the most notorious rule in all of the credit card game the Chase 524 rule. This used to be a rule that was so heavily enforced, so impossible to get around, that if anyone reported online being able to get around this rule, everyone called them a liar and said they didn't understand the credit card game. There was virtually, it was, this is the gospel of the credit card game. You could not get past this rule. Until about two months ago. So this rule effectively means that Chase will deny you for most of their credit cards and this is still true now, they'll deny you for most of their credit cards, if you've opened five or more credit cards from any bank in the past 24 months. The key important thing here is when we say that you've opened five or more credit cards in the past 24 months, it's only cards that show up on your credit report. If it's done on your credit report, it doesn't count. Chase can't see it. If I open five Amex cards today, which we can't, you can't do by the way, but let's say I did, and I apply for a Chase card today, Chase can't see those five Amex cards. They're not on my credit report yet. It usually takes between two to four weeks at least for a new credit card to show up on my report. So if Chase can't see it, it doesn't exist. Yes? Can they see other Chase cards that you have on Great question. So they can see it, however the data looks at they ignore it for some reason. So it is possible to be approved for two Chase cards on the same day, and I can successfully report uh, my own data point on this. I was at 424, meaning I had opened four cards in the past 24 months that were showing up on my credit report. I play for Chase card one, instantly approved. Later that night, I apply for Chase card two, also instantly approved. Two cards, I was above the 524 rule, because even though Chase could yes see the card and that I got approved, it was not on my credit report yet. So it did not necessarily count. That's like a very, yeah, very, very good question. So uh, any other questions before I move on from the slide? This rule is like mega important right here, the 524 rule. There, oh yes? Wonderful question. So do authorized user cards count? So the data shows that they do count authorized user cards toward 524. If, including authorized user accounts, you are beyond 524, you will be instantly denied. However, you can call the Chase reconsideration line, ask them to not count the authorized user cards because they're not yours, and they may choose to ignore them and potentially get you approved. They may or may not choose. So they can, they have for some people, for some people they also have not. So it's a bit of a risky bet, but it is absolutely possible to be approved for a Chase card if the only thing bringing you past 524 is your authorized user accounts. Yes? What um, credit agencies does Chase check with? Wonderful question. So what credit agencies do Chase check with? So Chase, in California at least, heavily pulls from Experian. So there's TransUnion, Experian, and Equifax. Chase almost exclusively pulls from Experian. They may pull a second bureau, but in my experience and what the data shows online is that it's pretty much always Experian. Yes? Yes, so yeah, that's a very good point. So I, was that your first Chase card that you applied for by any chance when they pulled both? 
Uh, sorry, what did you say? In your case, it was is your first Chase card. Uh, no, it's on all my Chase applications. On all of your Chase applications. Okay, that's interesting. So I guess it's different for different people. For me, they've only pulled Experian one time, and that was the first time I applied for a Chase card. Every other time, it's been exclusively uh, Equif or ex sorry, the first time they pulled Equifax. Every other time, it's been Experian. So it, it does depend on state as well. So there's data points of this online you can look up, and it will show you a chart of state to bank, and it will tell you approximately how often they pull each bureau. But typically, it's Experian. Yes? Is there a size limit for a room or a hundred room? Or is it like, if I have, um, like having four credit cards without paying for the charger, Great question. So ha does having like more cards, if you're still below 524, does that still hurt your chances? It will still hurt your chances, because you have a higher velocity, meaning you've opened a lot of cards still fairly recently. However, if you're below 524, it's not an automatic denial still because of that reason. Now, what used to be the case is that if you were above 524 and you were applying for any Chase card whatsoever, instant denial, no way around it, except for some few special techniques. Now it is the case that this has become a little bit more of a soft rule. So it doesn't apply for all Chase cards. So for example, the Southwest cards and the Amazon cards, both the personal versions, those do not necessarily, are, those are not necessarily fully affected by 524. So I was approved for a Southwest card at 524, which normally would not be able to be, hap would work. And other people report being approved for the Amazon card being uh, at or above 524. There's also reports of the United card being approved for that at 524 or above, and potentially some of the hotel cards. Now, the cards that it still seems to be fully enforced for are the business chase cards, or any of the Chase branded cards themselves. So for example, not a co-branded card, not like the Chase Hyatt or the Chase IHG, but just the Chase Freedom or the Chase Sapphire, right? Full Chase cards, not Chase with a partner card. Yes? Um, I guess I have two questions. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is like, why would you want to have multiple credit cards for like the same thing? And then like, and the second question is like, if, if that's like beneficial to you, like how would you want to like kind of take one card, or, like the two cards out of like Great question. Great question. So why would I want to have multiple cards from the same bank? And if so, why would I, or how would I pick which ones to choose? So the main reason you'd want multiple cards from the same bank is because different cards from each bank have different powers and abilities, right? They have different advantages. So maybe one Chase card helps me earn more on groceries, another one on my Hyatt hotel spend, another one on flights. So they all kind of cover each other's weaknesses. That's, that's one benefit. Another benefit, which we're going to talk about a little bit, if we have time, is that Chase has a currency called their ultimate reward system. It's a flexible rewards currency that can be combined between multiple Chase-owned cards. So for example, if you have the Chase Freedom and the Chase Sapphire, those points are actually the same and you can combine them. So by earning the bonus on those multiple cards and earning the bonus on the spending categories in both of those cards, you can combine them together, transfer them out for a bigger, larger redemption. And then in terms of picking the cards like, that you would want, that's a bit trickier. That's kind of depending on what the current offers are and what your priorities are. Any other questions? Yes? Oh, oh, so the, is the question um, like how to, is it, is it specifically like month ends or like weeks or how's that? So yeah, that gets a little tricky there. Usually you just do it by months. Now, it's usually safe to maybe wait about a full month after you go below 524 to apply for any Chase cards, just to be 100% sure. So you have a little extra buffer. Like, for example, I don't think it's a wise idea, like the day you go below 524, don't go apply for a Chase card then. That's a little risky. Wait about a month after. So yeah, uh, this used to be a hard rule, as we said. You can get certain cards while being above, and again, it's how many cards, oh, so your 524 status, when someone talks about that, it's just how many cards have you opened in the past 24 months. Again, when we say that though, it means only cards on your credit report. If you opened a card yesterday, that's not part of your 524 status, Chase can't see it. And so for example, if you open 10 cards in the past 24 months that show up on your report, you would say you are 1024. So because of this, you want to prioritize Chase cards. Think about it as a buffet. 
Okay, you got steak, and you got lobster. Let's say you like both. You, lo you love them both equal. Steak's gonna be here 24 seven. Lobster's going away in five minutes. It's a buffet, it's unlimited. Grab the lobster first, get the steak later. You can get them both, but only if you get the lobster first. You gotta prioritize what's going away, right? You can get other cards if you're past 524. If I'm at 624, I can go get American Express cards or cards from other banks. I can't get Chase cards, or at least it's significantly more difficult to get most Chase cards. So it's better to get the Chase cards while you're below 524, get the other cards when you're above. And so yeah, get Chase first, assuming you will be approved, of course, because otherwise, what's the point? So now let's talk about some American Express rules. So kind of the most notorious American Express rule is once in a lifetime. So for American Express, you can only receive the sign-up bonus on a particular American Express card once in your lifetime. I'm putting quotes around lifetime because the way they define it here is very tricky. Data points show that a lifetime for American Express is about seven years. So, <laughs> I, I, very, very way, weird way they define this. There's also something called no lifetime language offers, which are targeted offers from American Express to individuals that do not have any language about not being able to receive the bonus if you've gotten this card before. So it's basically the clause of the contract that says, hey, if you've ever gotten this card before and you've received the bonus, or even if you haven't received the bonus, this rule actually applies if you've ever held the card. So if you apply for, let's say, the platinum card today, don't reach the bonus, and at two years you try to get it again, too bad you're not getting the bonus. It's not even just receiving the bonus once, you can, once you hold the card, ineligible for the bonus if you don't receive it the first time you get it. Except in that case of a no lifetime language offer where if it doesn't say it, then you actually can get the bonus again. So those are targeted. It's possible to get those. But for the most part, if you're applying to a standard offer once in a lifetime, if you get an Amex card, you better reach the bonus on that card because you're not getting it again. They also have the one in five rule. So pretty much you can only be approved for one Amex card every five days. I hope no one's moving at that fast of a velocity where that becomes a problem. There's the 2 and 90 rule, where you can only be approved for two Amex cards every 90 days. This one's a little trickier, but again, I hope you're not getting three Amex cards in three months. That's, that's asking for a shutdown. And the final rule that we're going to talk about now is you can only hold five American Express credit cards at any one time. This does not include charge cards. So American Express is pretty much the only major bank to issue charge cards which are, so the American Express Platinum and Gold are the main ones. And so if you hold the Platinum or the Gold card, that doesn't count to this limit. There's a separate limit for that. It's calculated differently. Here though, you can only hold five American Express credit cards at one time. So if it's not a charge card, it's a credit card. Yes? Wonderful question. So for these rules, uh, sorry, to repeat the question for those online, uh, do business cards count to this? So for American Express, they can be a little weirder than Chase. For this case, from what I understand of the data points, it would probably still count. I haven't read specific reports of being able to get Amex business cards to get around these rules. However, these rules aren't so strict where there's really a need to go around them. The thing you have to understand about American Express, they're like a really friendly person to you at first. If you're nice to them and you play by their rules, they will reward you handsomely and they will treat you nice. If you go against their rules and you try to mess with them, they will hurt you. They will hurt you bad. They will not hesitate to close all of your accounts with them and take all your points away. So with American Express, you play by their rules and you'll be fine. Yes? So like for the once in a lifetime rule, you're saying like for other, like let's say for Chase, you can like start reach the sign up bonus for one, one card and then like open the same card again, get the same Great question. So the question was, you can't receive the sign-up bonus for Amex cards. You can only do it once in your lifetime. What about for other card issuers? So for other card issuers, it's dependent on the card and the program. But so for example, for Chase, most of their cards, you can earn the bonus every two years. For their Sapphire line of cards, it's once every four years. So it is dependent on the card issuer, and it is dependent on the particular card you're applying for. But most banks are nowhere near as strict as American Express. 
Yes? What's a charge card? The question was, what's a charge card? So wonderful question. The char a charge card is different than a credit card in the sense that a credit card has a predefined spending limit on it, right? Let's say you have a $10,000 limit on the card. That's the most you can spend, and the bank is telling you that directly. You do not have to pay the card off in full every month. You should, otherwise you're going to pay a ton of interest. But there's, the bank will allow you to not pay it off in full every month. A charge card does not have a predefined spending limit on it. The bank sets one for you in the background, but they don't tell it to you. If you go by the, beyond that limit, well, they're going to you know, not let you purchase anymore, but that's usually pretty rare because charge cards have very high limits. The difference is with the charge card, for most of the time, you have to pay it back in full every single month. There are, they've kind of, American Express has kind of turned them into credit cards a little bit where you can actually spread the purchases over a variety of months. But for the most part, you have to pay it back in full every month, unlike a credit card where you can carry a balance. So those are the two main differences. Yes? Is it somewhat similar to a debit card? card? The question was, is it somewhat, somewhat similar to a debit card? It's only similar to a debit card in the sense that it's, it would be extremely risky for someone to use it if they couldn't pay it back in full, because that's supposed to be the policy that you pay it back in full every month. And so for a debit card, right, you can only make a transaction if you actually have the money in your account. It's still different in the sense you have that 30 day or about like 30 to 50 day window to pay it back. But it's, it's similar to the debit card in the sense that it's a much smaller window you have. So let's talk about an intro to the points programs. So the actual good stuff, the actual earning, how to get this free travel we've been talking about. So there's two types, mainly, of the good points cards. There are co-branded cards, which earn specific kind of fixed points for one particular airline or hotel brand. For the most part, when you earn those points, they must stay within that currency. If I earn Hyatt points, I spend it on Hyatt. I can't transfer it anywhere else. You kind of can. You can transfer these out somewhat. Don't do it. It's a bad value. So if I'm earning Hyatt points, I'm going to spend them with Hyatt. Another example is Hilton or Marriott or Southwest. Marriott's kind of weird here because of, of all the currencies that are supposed to be kind of fixed, Marriott you can actually transfer out to a lot of partners. However, it's not an ideal redemption. It's not an ideal rate. So you can transfer that out to airlines, for example, to book flights. Usually it's not a smart decision. It can be sometimes, typically it's not. So there's also the other type of currency called a flexible currency. So these are bank issued points, which can be transferred out to travel partners. So examples of these include Chase Ultimate Rewards, uh, Thank You Points from City. Amex membership rewards. And again, this Bonvoy is kind of grayed out here. Somewhat Bonvoy, you can transfer so many places, it's almost like a flexible currency. But the main ones here, the two ones we really care about for now are Chase and Amex. Those are pretty much the main programs. City, Capital One also have good programs, and they are getting better, but Chase and Amex are still pretty much number one here. So what are the benefits of each currency type? So for co-branded, the main benefit you're going to get is on a co-branded card, typically the earning rate may be higher for that particular partner. So if I want to earn the most Hyatt points, typically the way to do that would be to put Hyatt spending on my Hyatt card. That's usually the benefit, right? On my Marriott card, if I spend a lot of points or a lot of money with Marriott, usually putting it on a Marriott card will yield you the most amount of points possible. Those are usually the benefits of putting spending on those cards. There's a plenty of other benefits with co-branded cards, and they're actually some of the best credit cards in the whole game. But in terms of earning rate of the currency, that's the main benefit. Now, flexible, as the name implies, it's you have flexibility. You can transfer points to whatever partner suits you best, right? And on that note, it also has gives you protection from devaluation. Let's say I hold a bunch of Hyatt points. And Hyatt says one day, hey, I'm going to cut my points value in half. I kind of just lost half of my value of points, right, overnight. With a flexible currency, with transfer partners, if one of the brands makes their points less valuable, who cares? I'll just transfer it out to a different brand. It still sucks. It can still hurt the value of the points a lot. But 
you still have that protection, right? If Hyatt devalues the points, maybe I use him for flights instead and still get very good value. Having him in a flexible system like that can be pretty nice. You also get the benefit of consolidation. So as we kind of were talking about having multiple cards from the same bank, if I hold multiple Chase cards that all use Chase's ultimate reward system, I can pool the points together into one account. And I can use that to transfer out to an airline partner or a hotel partner to make a bigger, larger redemption versus having all the points scattered across different programs. Points diversification of having it in various programs can be good, but consolidation is the best in terms of making very large, expensive redemptions. Any questions? All right. So kind of as an example of transfer partners, having transfer partners is what makes a flexible currency valuable at all. So the important thing is not quantity, but quality. The quality of the transfer partners actually are what makes the currency interesting. So these are the two main points currencies uh, that we're going to deal with, American Express and Chase Ultimate Rewards. You can see that Amex points actually has a significant amount more of transfer partners. right? Amex has a lot of airline transfer partners. The thing is, though, the quality of some of Chase's transfer partners actually surpasses Amex, particularly World of Hyatt. World of Hyatt is an extremely valuable transfer partner. It is the most, transfer, most valuable transfer partner, in my opinion, between the two, all of them. If Amex had Hyatt as a transfer partner, that would be a problem for Chase. This is kind of Chase's anchor of keeping the points value high. So this is something to understand, right? This is the quality of the transfer partners. You can have 50 transfer partners, and if none of them are any good, if I don't get any value for transferring my points there, who cares? The benefit is having quality transfer partners like World of Hyatt. Uh, on the Amex side, some quality partners uh, is usually ANA, Virgin Atlantic. It also could be Hilton on the right promotion. Sometimes they have bonuses transferring out points to Hilton. Under the right circumstances, this can actually be pretty valuable if you're staying at the very, very top tier Hilton hotels. Any questions so far? Okay, so now there's actually non-flexible bank points as well. So we talked about the co-branded points, right? Those are points of a particular airline or hotel partner. But there's, and there's flexible currencies of like Chase and Amex, but there's also bank points that aren't flexible. So you can't get outsized value from these points. And by outsized value, we just mean significant value over what the cash rate of the points is. Chase points, for example, convert at a rate of one cent per point if I redeem it for cash. So if we're going to be using it for travel, we better be doing better than one cent per point. Otherwise, why would I do this? I could just convert it to cash. I think we can all agree I'd prefer $100 cash over a $75 gift card to a hotel. I would just use the money to book the hotel. So we want to be getting outsized value. So some examples of non-flexible bank points, US Bank, Wells Fargo, and Bank of America. All their points currencies, in terms of the bank issued points, these are not transferable. The most you can get from these points is to book travel through their travel portal. It kind of increases the value of the points, but not enough to make us really, really care. That's why I don't like these banks, because they do not have transfer partners. Transfer partners are what makes a flexible currency or a bank currency valuable in the first place. Yes? For the, uh, for the hotel, no, for, for the bank, we use the, uh, for the bank for the, for the price higher than the market? Great question. So the, the question was, if we use the portal, will the price be higher than like what the market rate is? And the answer is, yes, it can be. It does depend. Some portals will be much better in terms of being exactly on the right price. Some aren't though. Sometimes they are slightly inflated. So that is something to keep in mind as well with bank portals. Another problem with like banks travel portals is that when you book through them, let's say you have elite status with a hotel and, you, and we'll, we'll talk all about elite status in the future. But let's say you have some elite status with a hotel and let's say my elite status is supposed to give me free breakfast when I'm there. And let's say I'm at a really expensive hotel and breakfast would normally cost $50 a person. If I book it through a travel portal, through a third party site, they often will not honor your elite benefits. They'll, they will give you like a worse room, 
or just they really won't care. They won't prioritize you and they won't honor your elite benefits. So that's another problem of booking through these portals is you're not booking directly through the hotel. The only way to guarantee your elite benefits are honored is to book directly through the hotel. So now, okay, we talked kind of about the basics of these points currencies. How do you start earning them quickly? So the main way that you're going to start earning points currencies quickly for most people, unless you're spending a lot of money, unless you are spending tens of thousands of dollars a month, this is going to be the thing that moves the needle the most. Sign up bonuses from cards. This is really what can make a significant difference and what can help you get real tangible free travel for free. So as an example here, we're going to talk about the Chase Sapphire Preferred. This is a very, very popular travel card. To be honest with you, the perks of the card, not very good. They're not that good. It has an annual fee, the perks aren't that good. So why, why is this card still good? The perks suck, why can this card be good? A few reasons. One, sign-up bonus is, is, right now it's pretty bad, normally it can be better. But it's 60,000 Chase Ultimate Rewards points. We'll talk about what this can be worth in a second. So first, you get 60,000 Chase Ultimate Rewards points currently. You must spend $4,000 within the first three months. The annual fee is $95, but you can downgrade it to a no annual fee card. The bonus right now is not very good, to be honest. It used to be much better. Even a few months ago, it was 100,000 points. 100,000 is wonderful. I don't know if that will come back, but 80,000 is a more appropriate bonus for this card. It still can be a good bonus to pick up and can make a big difference, but not as good as 100K or even 80K. Yes. So when I applied to this card, I got like 80,000 instead of 100,000. It just said that the bonuses haven't jumped up. So could I have like called them and like request like a higher bonus? Wonderful question. So the, the question was that, let's say I was signed up for a card and I received the bonus on that card. And let's say it was 60K points. And then a week later, the bank goes, oh, you know what? The new bonus is 80K. Can I call up the bank and say, hey, I just signed up for your card a few days ago. Can you change the bonus for me? And so the answer is it depends on the bank. For MX, they're gonna tell you to kick rocks. They do not care. The bonus you sign up for is the bonus you get, too bad. They are very strict about that. But as a little side note, that's why whenever you're signing up for an MX card, you should not just use the public link. You should go to incognito mode because they try to target people that haven't searched up Amex before because they think you're a new customer they wanna entice you in. You should also check referral links. Referral links may have higher offers. And you should also check pre-qualification tools. So for Amex, no luck uh, increasing the bonus. For Chase, it used to be the case where you could call them up and then would, as a gesture of good faith, increase the bonus for you if they like increase the public offer. Now, not so much. Most people have not had luck doing that. So I would say, to be honest, it's tough to get them to increase the bonus if you applied for a lower bonus right before. So try to make sure that when you're applying for cards, you're getting a high elevated offer. If the bonus isn't good, you might wanna wait. Now be careful with that because, you know, you don't want to leave this big bag of money on the table and you're like, oh, I want it to be a bigger bag of money. I don't want it. So you should still take it if it's not going to get any better. But sometimes it can get a lot better. So just be careful with that. Now, for example here, we're going to assume that you and a player two that you have both got this Chase Sapphire preferred card. Now, normally, if you and a player two are signing up for the same card, you should refer each other. Person A gets the card first, refers the player two, the player two gets the card, and player A gets the bonus for you both to use on travel. Let's assume for some reason we didn't do that. So we're working now with a bankroll of 120,000 Chase Ultimate Rewards points. How much can these be worth? So we're gonna talk about cents per point. So this is an evaluation of how to figure out how much cash value you're getting from your points. Some people think that this is a stupid metric and that you shouldn't care and that it should only be about the experience you're getting and oh, am I, do I find this to be fun? Do I find this to be a good redemption? I agree to a point, but not exactly. For example, if your points are getting absolutely horrific value, sometimes it could be better to convert to cash. The idea with this is to say, look, not necessarily how much money am I saving, but how much am I achieving now that I wouldn't have otherwise been able to achieve? So for Chase points, what's considered good value? I would say really good, three cents or above per point. I want to shoot higher for this, to be honest, and some of the high-end places you really can shoot higher. But if you're getting above three cents per point in your chase points, you're doing very well, no complaints whatsoever. 
And to calculate this, we just take the cash price of something, divide it by how many points it costs, and multiply it by 100. That's how many cents of value you're getting per point. Target would be two to three cents. Two to three cent range, still completely fine. That's very good. Decent, 1.5 to two cents per point. That's OK. Nothing, like, it's not that bad, but it, it, it could be better. If you're getting between 1.25 and 1.5, it's fine. We want to shoot better. We want to shoot higher for that. If you're getting less than 1.25 cents, you should not be redeeming the points. Because when you hold the Chase Sapphire Preferred card, so the base level card that lets you transfer out Chase points, you can actually book travel through Chase's travel portal at a rate of 1.25 cents per point. So if you're getting less than this, don't use the points to transfer them out. Just book it through the portal, it would be cheaper. Now, if you're redeeming for cash, then it's a whole different ball game there. But for travel, if you're going below 1.25 cents, shouldn't be redeeming it at all. But for me, I'd say minimum, at least 1.5 you should be getting. Ideally, two to three or higher. Now, so what can you actually get? I told you like kind of the evaluation in terms of how much cash value can you get for your points. What's a concrete example of what you might redeem your points for? So for Chase points, they transfer at their hotel to airline partners at a minimum of a one to one rate. So if I have 100,000 or 120,000 Chase points, they will transfer to Hyatt to 120,000 Hyatt points, one to one. Hyatt is usually the optimal transfer partner for Chase. Not always, but usually. So as a concrete example here, let's look at how much it costs to redeem Hyatt points. This is Hyatt's award chart. We can see we have a range from category one hotels to category eight. Category one are the most budget cheap hotels, not necessarily bad, just the cheapest hotels. Category seven and eight are their mega ultra luxury resorts. It used to be the case that pretty much every Hyatt owned property capped out at 30K points. Sadly now, some of the really good ones that used to cap out at 30K might go up, are gonna go up to 40 to 45K. Uh, this is part of the assignment this week is to watch the video I made on it. It'll, it's on the credit, card, credit Cal site. So basically 30 to 40,000 points at the very high end. Now, so let's look at a, a real concrete example now. So let's say we have, let's take the Hyatt Regency in Bali, Indonesia. This was just downgraded to a category one hotel. When a hotel is downgraded to category, that is good for us. It just got cheaper. So it is 5,000 points per night. The cash rate, if I wanted to stay here, is around 130. Could be more, could be less. Well, let's average it at 130. This is a little, honestly, a little conservative. So what we do is we take the cash price. That should be 5,000. This was updated actually because this used to be 8,000. It actually just got downgraded from a category two to a category one. So pretend this is 5,000. We take the cash price, divided by the points price, multiply it by 100, we get a value of 2.6 cents per point. That's pretty good, especially for a hotel that only costs 5,000 points a night. On the other end of the spectrum, we have Alila Ventana Big Sur, category eight hotel, just upgraded. Very sad that it got upgraded to a category eight. The points cost here is 40,000 Hyatt points per night for a standard rate night. The cash price is around $2,000 a night. That's honestly pretty conservative. Divide the, the cash by the points cost, rate of five cents per point. That's very, very good. Yes, is this skewed a bit? Because would we actually pay $2,000 a night for this place? No, that's not really the point. The point is, look, I couldn't pay the $2,000. That's why it's cool. That's why it's fun to do this stuff because I couldn't pay the cost. Now, for this, if I had 120,000 Hyatt points, I would have 24 nights at the Hyatt Regency in Bali. All it took was me and a player two to sign up for two suboptimal bonus cards. The bonus wasn't good right now. We didn't even get the referral bonus. Two cards, 24 nights in Bali. Pretty good to me. The cash price of that would be about $3,100. Just from, again, two credit cards. For Alila Ventana Big Sur, you would get three nights for that. The cash price would be $6,000 if you were to like actually pay in cash. Uh, any questions before we look at the action items? Yes. Or, the, yes, or yeah? Uh, what's the point difference between less than 
Great, great question. So the question was, what's the difference between the points of the Freedom like Flex and the Sapphire Preferred? The answer is there's no difference. They're actually the same points currency. Here's the thing though. If you only hold the Freedom Flex, that does not give you the ability to transfer the points out to the partners like Hyatt. So if you want to transfer them to points like Hyatt, you must hold either the Sapphire Preferred, the Sapphire Reserve, or the Inc. Business Preferred card. If you hold any of those cards, you can transfer your Freedom Flex points to the Sapphire card, let's say, and then you could transfer from there out to Hyatt. So that's why holding the, the Reserve, the Preferred, or the Inc. Business can be very valuable because you need those to transfer out here. But other than that, the points currencies are the same. That's why when you earn on the Freedom, it's good to keep the points to transfer them out. Yes? How often do the sign-up bonuses, sign bonuses change? So it can be pretty frequent every few months, depending on the card. So it, it does depend, right? Usually there's like an elevated offer or two for a Chase card going on at every, any given time. I would say maybe once every six months, usually there's probably some kind of elevated offer per card or something changed. It, and so it's good to kind of keep an eye out for what's changing. So if that Sapphire 80K offer comes back, I would say that's pretty good, I would take it. Especially if you can uh, refer your player to to it, that could be pretty powerful. Uh, but yeah, usually at least every six months, maybe it could be less. Some cards like the Sapphire Reserve don't change that much, to be honest. The Sapphire Reserve had a 100,000 point bonus when it came out. People thought, oh, I'm gonna wait, it's gonna go higher. Never went higher, went down to like 60K or 50K. People are like, oh, I'm waiting for the 100K for like five years, never came back. So you gotta be careful with that too. But usually they do change somewhat often. So you're not like, shouldn't be just sitting there waiting in the dust. Any other questions? Can you downgrade to no annual fee? Um, does the property still exist? Like... Yeah, so yeah, if you downgrade the card to a no annual fee card, depending on the like specific line of cards in the bank, it, should, it will still be pretty much the same. So if, if you downgrade, let's say, your Sapphire Reserve to a Freedom, which you can do, the points stay the same, the, the card still shows up on your credit report as the same age, and you still keep the points. You just can't transfer them out anymore. Okay, so we're pretty much at time. So there's no quiz this week. Uh, however, uh, I would appreciate if you watched the video I made on the height devaluation on the website because I think it's a good uh, understanding of that you have to be spending your points because if you just hoard them, they're just gonna keep going down in value. So that's pretty much all we have this week. Now please fill out the attendance form and feedback form. Uh, feedback form if you can, but at the very least attendance form.